Willkommen in den Nein, in den Aufregens Video. Welcome to yet another exciting video. In this case, part 7 of my Napoleonish Kriegsführung video series. In this video, I'll be covering the foreign movement phase, specifically close assault. The uh, foreign movement phase is the heart of the entire game system and as such represents a major portion of the rules. As a result, this video would be too long if I attempted to cover all aspects of this phase. In this video, I'll only be covering a close assault, which represents melee. An element can attempt to move into the same spot as an enemy element triggering close assault. The close assault move represents the movement of elements into base-to-base -base contact with enemy elements as well as the movement of all supporting elements. These elements are part of an attacking combat unit and a command point is required to order the attacking combat unit to conduct the close assault move. In order to conduct the close assault, the close assault element must expend an action to initiate the close assault and then must move into base-to-base -base contact with the target element to initiate the actual close assault which requires a second action. As a result, an element requires at least two actions to initiate close assault. The action to initiate close assault occurs first, followed by the action required to actually move into base to base contact. Unless you expend two command points, no element can move into base to base contact with an enemy element. That's in addition, that is, in addition to the actions, you need command points as well. Let's look at close support for the attackers. Up to two elements in base to base contact and directly behind the close assault element and any number of elements which are in base to base contact with both the close assault element and the target element can support the close combat. This is called close support. Elements in contact at the corner are considered in base to base contact. Only support elements, you know, close support elements must expend an action to provide close support in the same way that you would if you want to conduct close assault, as well as remaining in base to base contact with a close assaulting element or an element to its front, which is in base-to-base -base contact with the close assaulting elements at all times. As a result, an element needs at least two actions to initiate close support. The action to initiate close support obviously occurs first, as before, followed by the action required to move the element into the close support position. Let's look at the defender's close support. Up to two elements directly behind the target of the close assault and any number of elements which are in base-to-base -base contact with both the close assault element and the target element can support the close combat. In this case, the non-facing player does not need to expend any actions or command points. When an element closes into base-to-base -base contact with an enemy element and conducts close assault, there will be mandatory opportunity fire and this is a special opportunity fire. The close support elements can also trigger opportunity fire due to its movement during the close assault move. There is no special opportunity fire trigger for close support elements, and in many cases these elements will be shielded from opportunity fire by the element to its front, or will not receive opportunity fire because the target enemy element has already exceeded its two opportunity fire limit per non-phasing phase. The close assault element is always considered an opportunity fire trigger irrespective of any other rules when it achieves base-to-base -base contact with the target, as well as its move into base-to-base -base contact. If the close support element can be subject to opportunity fire as it moves into close assault or support the close assault, then the target can conduct opportunity fire against this element up to the standard limit of two opportunity fire combats in any non-phasing fire and movement phase. Irrespective of the number of opportunity fires which occur prior to the close assault, an element can always conduct opportunity fire against the element attempting to dislodge it, the close assault element, thus can conduct opportunity fire three times in a, in a non-phasing fire and movement phase. Opportunity fire against close support elements always follows the two opportunity fire limit. The close combat is assumed to be occurring in the location the defending element resides in. Thus, any negative terrain effects affects the close assaulting element. The close assaulting element, that is the attacker, can never benefit from terrain, but will suffer from any negative effects. Any effect is implemented after all opportunity fire is conducted. If movement into the terrain is prohibited, the close assault cannot occur. That element can conduct close support if another eligible element can be the close assault element. 
The close support element is not affected by any terrain in the location the defending element resides in. It provides support from a distance, basically. The movement which results in a close assault only needs to result in base-to-base -base contact with the element. It does not need sufficient movement to occupy the area the enemy element occupies. Let's look at an example of how a close assault fits in with movement in fire combat. The Austrian Light Infantry can be observed as they are on the edge of the built-up area and the terrain is not blocking LOS. The medium or the French artillery conducts direct, direct fire combat against one of the Light Infantry elements um, and they'll be expending both actions doing it. In the first action, we get artillery versus Light Infantry. It's direct fire at four base widths. The FE is six. There is modifiers, cover in rough, that is the skirmishers are in rough terrain, the built-up area, and they're taking cover, minus two. The row is four, which means we get four D6, long range, half the D6, resulting in two D6 are thrown. Two dice are thrown with one hit, the Austrian spinner three save, resulting in no effect. The same process is repeated in the second action, except in this case, we still get the one hit, but the Austrian spinner one, which means that they fail the test and it results in a disorder. There is no return fire because the range is too great. Let's now move down to the Musketeer, launching a direct fire against the Light Infantry. Now in this case we're assuming the artillery were part of a different combat unit, which is why we conducted both actions separate from the Light Infantry. If it was part of the same combat unit, then every, everyone would conduct the first action first and then the second action second, so to speak. We'll assume they're separate. Okay, we've got infantry versus light infantry, direct at one base width, FE4, row is three, column four, modifiers cover in rough, which means that uh, the row drops down to two, which means we get two dice, it's long range, we halve it, which means we get one dice. One dice is throw, zero hits. The um, second infantry fires, um, or in the second um, action, the same thing occurs and we get zero hits. The lesson to be learned here is musket fire is not effective against troops in stone buildings. During the Austrian fire and movement phase, an action is expended to recover from disorder. In this case, the bottom two musketeer elements, the French, are going to be expending actions uh, in order to close into close assault with the French Grens. In the first sub action subphase, it expends an action to initiate close assault, no movement in this case. During the second action, its commander also expends an additional command point and it moves into contact with the enemy. It's assumed to be moving in the spot the defenders occupy, which in this case requires the element to adopt a loose formation. This occurs immediately. Note that opportunity fire will occur twice, the two light infantry, but let's assume it has no impact. The musketeer versus light infantry, the close combat FE is four. Uh, there are modifiers covering rough, that is the defenders are in cover in rough, built up areas rough. They're in loose formation, that is the attackers are in loose formation, so minus three, which means we end up with a, a column, um, we end up with four dice in this case. The support element to the rear has the same factors, but it's considered to be a long range, which means it ends up with two dice. Six dice to throw, three, sa three hits, save rollers, four, no effects. The light infantry conduct close combat in return. It's got a FE of four, um, there is some modifiers. It's in cover, minus one. It's in loose formation, minus two, which means its total number of dice thrown is five. Five dice are thrown, two hits, save rolls three, no effect. In this case, the um, attackers will probably eventually win, but only just. The close combats continue to uh, apply round after round after round. Eventually, I suspect, based on maths, the French will disorder the Austrians and cause it to retreat. The defenders do certainly have a chance if their die rolling is good enough. This ends the close assault of the attacking combat unit. A better strategy would be for both line infantry forces to close in close combat, but this achieves basically the same effect. It will be impossible for the line infantry to dislodge the line infantry, and in the next game turn, the top line infantry We'll close the combat with the um, other uh, Grens or French turning its flank and taking the town, although it requires significant forces in order to do this, which is quite reasonable. However, the example I provided is rather unusual. A close assault rarely only involves a single close assault combat. In this case, a French attacking combat unit is conducting close assault against three Prussian elements, which form a defensive combat unit. 
While this is a single close assault, there are actually three separate close combats occurring, one per Prussian element. Let's look at another example. Two line infantry elements are conducting close assault against the Prussian line infantry element. This expends an action to conduct the close assault, and at least one French element must have sufficient movement points to move into base to base contact with the Prussian element, and the other must remain in base to base contact with it. In this case, both elements are conducting close assault. Well, one is the support and the other is the close assault. If successful, the close assault element occupies the location the Prussian infantry element occupied, and the close support element can occupy the spot the close assaulting element occupies if, if they so desire. In this case, either French element could be considered the close assault element, so the bottom one could be the close assault and the other close, uh, 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 close uh, assault, and, or vice versa. Close uh, combat, uh, we have the, uh, the infantry versus infantry, close combat FE4, we end up basically with seven dice, there are no modifiers. The closer support is halved, so rounding up, so it's four dice. The French spin 11 dice with five hits, Prussian spin A4 for its save and is disordered. The Prussians fight back, uh, musketeer versus musketeer, it's an FE of four, there are no modifiers. Uh, basically the result is seven dice, the Prussians spin seven dice with three hits, the French spin a four, there is no effect. If it spun a one, two or three, both elements would now be disordered. The combat now goes to a second round, with either player giving the option to retreat. Any more disorder results will re result in a disruption occurring. As a result, the Prussian element would be wise to retreat in this case. Instead of fighting out, the Prussians decide to retreat, disordered, to base widths. The French player selects the close assault element and moves it into the spot vacated. Because the close support element was not in the rear of the close assault element and was instead eligible to provide close assault because it was in base to base contact with the enemy to its side, it remains in place in this case. Normally this close support would be to the rear and it would occupy, they would all simply move forward in the big blunt block. This does not occur in this particular case. However, if the close support element was in the rear of the close assault element, it could move forward, remaining in base-to-base -base contact with the close assault element if the close combat was won. And this is a more secure position in case the Prussians decide to counterattack. The close assault move must be a simple forward move, but can include a sideward move to up to half the forward move. In this case, the element moves forward one base width and sideways half a base width. The forward and sideward move must be consistent, so for each one base width forward move, the element moves sideways half a base width. Before any movement occurs into close assault, an element can wheel or change facing. In this case, the element wheels 20 degrees and then moves forward and sideward. It could also wheel 45 degrees, move straight ahead, and when its corner is contacted with the enemy element, it can pivot to line up with the enemy element edge. Either way is viable. If an element conducting a close assault move contacts a target on a corner, that it's its corner, it can pivot to align with the target's edge at the end of the move, even if this exceeds the element's movement allowance. Because in this case the French element did not start its move behind a line parallel with the enemy element's front edge, it cannot contact a flank. It first wheels, ensuring the element is never behind the enemy element's flank, it then moves forward, and when its corner touches the enemy element corner, it then wheels again to line up with the enemy element's front. Note, a 90 degree wheel costs um, a base width, or one movement point, so the element can only move a further base width. Once it contacts the enemy element, the pivot is conducted at no movement cost. To avoid players gaming the system, the element must be at least one centimetre behind, or a quarter of a base width, behind the target's front edge to be able to contact the flank. So even if the element was um, basically um, fractionally behind, it would still follow this convoluted move in order to contact the ele enemy element's front. In this example, the French element starts its move at least a quarter base width behind a line parallel with the enemy's element's front edge. Thus it can contact its flank. It first wheels and then moves forward until it's, it's in base-to-base -base contact with the enemy element. Note that a 90 degree wheel does have a movement impact. In this example, both French and Prussians can have one element involved in the close assault and one close support element. 
This is not a good attack, but certainly not foolish. In this example, the French has one close assault and one close support element, while the Prussian have one element involved in the close assault and two close support elements. This is tactically unwise for the French to do. In this example, both French and Prussians have one element involved in close assault and one close support element. Why would the Prussians leave a gap? The answer is to cover the front line. In most cases, you want all elements in base-to-base -base contact for an optimal defence line. In this example, both French and Prussians have one element involved in close assault and one close support element. Why would the French launch such attack? The answer is they want to try and break through in the spot they attacked, as it does not make much difference how they launch their attack. In this example, a breakthrough by the French is unlikely, although certainly possible. In this example, the French have launched a complex close assault, with three separate close combats resulting. The phasing player starts with the centre close, close combat. The French player wins this close combat and the Prussian retreats. After advancing the central element, um, it finds itself in base-to-base -base contact with the Prussians on either side. These elements uh, cannot influence the close combat on either flank, but if the Prussian elements remain in base-to-base -base combat after all close combat has been conducted, follow-on close combat will be required and there will be an impact. This continues until no opposing elements are in base-to-base -base contact with each other at the end of the phase. In this example, the French have launched a close assault resulting in two separate close combats. The French can duck the lower com close combat first, but loses, resulting in the line infantry retreating. Not all hope is lost yet, as in the top close combat, they win, resulting in the Prussian line infantry retreating and the French advancing. Both close combats are completed, but there are still elements in base-to-base -base contact with each other, so follow-on close assault occurs. Follow-on close assault occurs only occurs after all the initially defined close combats have been completed. In this case, the French player has one element in base space -base contact on its flank. This will be the close assault element. The French element to its rear can provide close support in two ways, either as providing rear close support or as in base-to-base -base contact with the enemy using that method. Its die is halved twice, once for the close support, that's its close support element, and the other for flank attack. Incidentally, the um, close assault elements uh, dice numbers are also halved because it's launching its close assault out of its flank, as is the return Prussian close assault. The French player has a good chance of winning this as, w as well, and um, it may take a while, I have to admit, because the die rolls are quite low, but uh, I suspect in this case, the Prussian will be defeated and will be forced to retreat. In this example, the French close support is a very light foot artillery element, which represents four pound guns. The artillery has a low movement allowance, in this case one base width, while being manhandled. This means the French, incidentally, artillery can't launch close assault when they're being towed. They have to be manhandled. Now this means the French line infantry have to start the attack within enemy musket range. If the element has three actions, this is probably viable, but getting three actions is rare. Nonetheless, this is possible even for a light, uh, a light artillery. Larger guns are too slow for this kind of attack. It's easier to simply use infantry to support, which is what occurred um, between 1800 and 1805 when the gun sizes became larger. The idea of rolling guns in with the infantry close assault kind of um, became unfashionable fairly quickly. Let's now look at the close assault in more detail. Assuming this attack gets through the opportunity fire without being disordered, let's see what happens. The French player conducts closer combat against the Prussian element. The infantry element has an FE of 4, there are no modifiers. A close assault it means we get... Um, seven dice, um, the result is seven dice. The close support artillery has a FE of four as well. One reason why artillery being used in close assault doesn't make much sense. The light guns don't have much benefit over musketeers. But anyway, let's put that to one side. Nonetheless, it gets uh, once again seven dice, but it's hard because it's close support, result is four. The French spin 11 dice with five hits. The Prussian spin a four for a save and is disordered. The Prussians then counter, FE of 4, no modifiers, it uses a 7 die, 
the Russians or the Prussians spin seven die with three hits, the French spin a four, and there is no effect. The French will win this close assault. Let's see what would happen if the French were disordered by the Prussian opportunity fire as it came into contact. In this case, the close assault element is disordered. The um, FE is still four, um, gets seven dice. The close assault is um, half the dice because it's disordered. The result, it only gets four D6s. Now, the artillery to the rear wouldn't have been disordered in the close, in the opportunity fire, so it still gets another four. The French spins uh, eight dice with three hits. The Prussians spin a four for the save and is unaffected. The Prussians respond, uh, let's say, with the same die roll, so there's no effect. Basically, what we've got here is the Prussians are throwing seven dice and the French are throwing eight dice. There's still a chance of victory, but it's uh, a fairly narrow victory, and the Prussians could very well win this day or win the battle. Let's see what happens if you're close assaulting an enemy unit which is disordered. In this case, the Prussian line infantry is disordered. Now, if the defender suffers another disorder result, the disorder element is disrupted and physically removed. This ends the close combat. But if the attacker advances after combat, which it has to, a follow-on close combat would occur with the previous close support element to the rear, which is not disordered in this case. Uh, nonetheless, it's highly likely the French would be able to punch their way through in this case uh, because they simply have three elements with four FEs against one poor old Prussian element. So they would probably spin twice the dice. Let's look at what occurs in this uh, follow-on situation. The attacker advances up the combat and the support element remains in base-to-base -base contact with it and it also has base-to-base -base contact with the Prussian previous closer support element. So there is a follow-on closer assault occurring here. Incidentally, if the Prussian line infantry to the front of it had withdrawn or retreated when it became initially dis disordered, then it could have taken the element to the rear with it, thus avoiding follow-on combat. Let's take a look at uh, what happens when one of the close support elements is disordered. In this case, one of the enemy elements providing close support is disordered, as you can see in the middle, the middle line infantry. If the defender suffers a disorder result, the disordered element is disrupted and removed. Now, this is not possible when it's in close support. Um, however, what occurs is that the close support element, when it provides close support, it's halved twice. And that's the main impact. Now, of course, if there's follow-on combat, let's say the front Prussian element was disrupted or it withdrew without carrying the rest of the forces with it and the French advanced, remaining in base-to-base -base contact, then it could have done follow-on close combat against the close support element. Of course, a second disorder resulting in a disruption. Let's look at some examples of evading by a skirmish troop. In this example, the French launch a close assault against the Prussian skirmish elements. When they contact the Prussian skirmishers, the skirmishers, instead of engaging in close assault for the first round, decide to evade. The skirmishers move backwards and turn to face the front where they get when they get to the rear of the Prussian line elements. Should be noted that the skirmishers can conduct opportunity fire before they evade. Should also be noted the skirmishers may also decide to stand and fight, which would be probably not a wise decision. If the skirmishers do evade in this situation, because the skirmishers evade, the French actually won that close assault and advanced into the vacated space the skirmishers left behind. This puts them in base-to-base -base contact with the Prussian line in the rear. Now, when all other normal close assault is conducted, you can now conduct follow-on close combat, and that's what will occur in this particular case. After all those close assaults have been conducted, we then conduct follow-on combat, and in this case, the skirmishers can act as close support. Let's look at the opposite example where the uh, Prussians have skirmishers to the front and decide to launch a close assault through the skirmishers. The, this uh, entire six elements are activated for close assault. The line infantry moves through the skirmishers into base-to-base -base contact with the actual line infantry. It should be noted that the six elements would be activated for, for movement and if you want the skirmishers to provide close support, when it's activated again, to conduct close assault, those skirmishes need to be included. 
So what we end up with is the line infantry are now in base-to-base -base contact with the French. The skirmishers are to the rear. Now, if the distance travelled is greater than what you see here, the skirmishers can actually link up to the end of the last line infantry unit and be carried forward as well. The point being is that uh, you can close assault through skirmishers and the skirmishers can still provide close support. I mean, in basic terms, um, we don't have great massive solid blocks of men where there's no room to manoeuvre. When you launch an attack, you launch an attack in columns with big gaps all over the place. The skirmishers are basically running around in the gaps, providing some level of support. And so we come to an end of my part seven of my video on Napoleonish Kriegsführung rules, in this case, looking at the fire and movement phase, specifically close assault. Alle guten Dingen kommen zu einem Ende.